Hello. Uh, my name's Simon, and I'm a senior engineer at Gitpod. Um, I'm also uh, from Birmingham in the UK, uh, so anybody who knows that, that's where I'm from. Um, basically, go to London, go off a bit, and turn left. Um, now, I'd like to just sort of say right from the start, I don't. this is not going to be a trashing on Helm. I've used Helm for a hell of a long time. I've used Helm even back in V2, and I'm one of the few people who actually thought that Tiller wasn't that bad. Uh, which I know is quite a, a very small subset. Um, and I think that Helm 3 is truly brilliant. It's one of the best pieces of kit in, in Kubernetes land. Um, I joined uh, Gitpod in August of last year, and my focus has been uh, primarily on uh, improving the self-hosted installation and the self-hosted use of Gitpod. Um, and in the self-hosted, we have two prime users. Um, so the first prime user is obviously self-hosted users. And those range from single user people who have uh, very, very little experience of Kubernetes. And they'll very often, I've actually, we've actually had one people, somebody in our Discord channel go, Kuba what? Uh, which is obviously something that's very concerning when somebody tries to install Kubernetes. And we go all the way right up to Massive Bank PLC. Uh, they've got thousands of Kubernetes uh, clusters out there, and they're working on that, and that's that. they're working on that quite fine. And even two core contributors, those are some of our uh, people who use it as well. And the other distinct user we have in self-hosted is Gitpod.io. Gitpod is primarily a SaaS product, it has historically been, and a self-hosted, they have become one of our customers. We treat self, We treat the SaaS no different to as a self-hosted customer. And that's the intention we want to be, get to. So first question is, what is Gitpod? Um, we actually have uh, three other Gitpodders in the room. Um, so obviously, if anybody wants a demo on this later, uh, please grab me or any of my colleagues. Um, but Gitpod is an open source development platform for remote development. This is going to be the next new big thing for, for people out there. No more, oh, it works on my machine. That's what we invented CICD for so we can have uh, consistent tests to make sure it works and we have consistent deployment. But if you've got somebody who works on a Windows machine, somebody who works on a Mac, or somebody like myself who works on Linux, you could get a binary that works slightly differently between the two. If you're going to deploy it in Kubernetes, which will prim primarily be a Linux platform, that you might end up introducing variants between those three platforms. With Gitpod, you don't have that because you're all working on the same platform. So if it works in Gitpod, you know it's going to work wherever you're going to deploy it. Uh, Self-hosted, uh, so you can code in the browser as well with this. So this is the this is the browser. I'm really sorry that this is actually quite small. I did this presentation last week on a cinema screen, uh, whereas that picture there of me was actually twice the size of my real, real head, which is really terrifying walking up to it. Um, but this is Gitpod in, in a browser. This is our sort of our primary use case. So most people would code it in the browser. Recently, we've also introduced VS Code Remote, and as of about two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, we introduced a partnership with JetBrains. Um, so it now works natively. Uh, with jet brains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and self host is a really important part of this business. So historically, we were a SaaS, SaaS first product. Quite a difficult sentence to say. Um, but if you're Massive Bank PLC or if you're a government agency, you need to, to ensure uh, ownership over your data. So that is where self hosted comes in. And self hosted is the big commercial driver for the business. Let's go. Um, the Olympics were just opening in Tokyo a year late. Lewis Hamilton was leading Max Verstappen in the F1 Championship. And a slightly younger Simon joined Gitpod. Um, and uh, the self-hosted team didn't exist. I was the first member of the self-hosted team. And we had a really messy installation experience for users. We had a Helm chart. We had Helm charts that had grown exponentially. We've got lots and lots of components in there. It's, just, it's, it's sort of, I suppose you could describe it as a type of microservice, how it's architected. Um, each of these microservices had their own Helm charts. There might have been six or seven on them. We have 50-odd components. Somebody who's better at math can multiply 50 by seven. Um, you know, that's a lot of Helm charts that we had in there. They were all owned by the platform team. So again, there was no ownership over that code. It was one of those things where if you sort of had something, it was very, very the tendency was to sort of throw it over the wall and let the platform team deal with it. Well, of course, the platform team, they don't know how we've coded something. So if we've got something where we're having to play around and mess with, I don't know, the container D 
um, uh, binaries on the host machine. Well, the platform team is not going to know how we've coded it. So it's, it's very, it was very much a siloed system in there. And the reality was that everybody was afraid to touch it. We'd sort of invented our own COBOL uh, attacks, where just, it was just one of those things that had just nobody really wanted to touch it. And the, re the reality was that self-hosted releases happened whenever we wanted them to. Anyway, there was no sort of cycle for it. In SaaS, that was great because it meant that, you know, if we were going to release something, we could say, right, okay, so uh, guys, we're going to release something on Tuesday. Can we make sure we get the release ready? Test it in a few days before. That, brilliant. But because there was nobody whose primary focus was on self-hosted, happened in July of last year in the, in the Helm charts. And so we were getting to sort of November, December time. People, was, there was tickets in our GitHub repo saying, "When's the next self-hosted release, please?" But it is worth asking at this point because there might be things that we can take from this. So the first thing it does is it's a template generator. In there, we do a bit of fancy magic with GoLang template values, and we get out a beautiful template at the end of it. This is where most of our problems are. We'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, third party, this is actually really useful. Now, I'm only one person in self-hosted team. There's now five of us in there. Even as GitPub, we're only about 65 people. I don't want to be maintaining Gitpod. I don't want to be maintaining our database deployments. I don't want to be maintaining our message queue deployments. There's lots of people out there who do that and they there's a lot of people out there. Let's build on that rather than take it and rather than rejecting all that. Let's try and use that. And there's also a fancy kubectl apply. When I say fancy kubectl apply, if you just do kubectl and apply in it, if you remove a resource, that kubectl apply will just stick it there and it won't do anything with it. If you're using Helm, it stores the state in a config map. So if you're not using it anymore, it gets rid of it. That's really useful. Let's just discuss actually what Gitpod is. Obviously, it's Gitpod. <laughs> that sounds really straightforward, but it's, a, it's as a, an application, it's both complex and it's straightforward. So if you look at it actually, so these are some of the technical requirements that we have. So we need to have Linux kernel version 5.4 above. We need to be running container D, and we need to be running on Ubuntu machines. Those are technical limitations based on because of the fact we're maintaining things, and we can discuss later if, separately if you want as to why we need to do that. But it's actually, is from a Kubernetes point of view, it's actually fairly straightforward. Okay, so we've got a couple of, we've got some config maps, we've got some secrets, we've got deployments, daemon sets, and stateful sets. There's a couple of, um, there's the certificate, the, the, there's a certificate CRD in there, but it's not particularly complex. It's just big. We also have. MySQL, Docker Registry, and Object Storage, those three could be external if we wanted to. They don't have to be in cluster. Um, RabbitMQ is our message queue, and for reasons that I haven't actually fully understood, that needs to be on our cluster. We maintain that ourselves. But again, that's, that comes from the Helm chart historically. Um, the first one is the config. The YAML file, the smallest, 750 lines long. If you're coming into that, if your boss has said to you, hey, I've heard good things about Gitpod, go and see if it, we can use it self hosted, your first thing is you look at that and you're presented with a 750 line config file. It's also most of our documentation historically was download, configure open SSL, generate a random password. Now that's a really bad look for when your product is all about automation and automating development environments. If the first step is you've got to go through, you've got to create four or five random passwords, not a great look. Not orthogonal. Basically that means you have to change it in multiple places in the values YAML in order to change one thing. If you're going to change your MySQL database password, for instance, it had to be changed in about three or four different places the Helm YAML file, you can't reference internally. So if you're using it, say for instance, if you've got to use your one dependency, has got to use it, we've well got to use that value in the different dependencies. You can't do it that way. 
Helm functions are unreadable. So the platform team had done a brilliant job in creating a load of Helm functions in order so that we could reuse it. That's what they do. That was brilliant. But of course, because it's in Golang template values, they're basically unreadable. I want to know that if I'm going to be deploying an application, I want to know it's going to work. If you remember, I said that actually Git pod requires limitations. There's no way in Helm of saying, make sure this is running on an Ubuntu machine or it's got Kubernetes, or it's got the uh, kernel 5.4 and above. That doesn't, that doesn't exist in, um, in Helm. And we have all these internal certificates which have to be created manually. Now, the reality. Real refactor, we could probably solve most of them or get them to a factor that's actually acceptable. This is something I've, I've coined. And I'm going to show you readable, I think, on the side of this screen. But, you know, this is a this config map looks like. Now, there's no uh, inside any other and I put two mistakes in it. Oh dear. There's no way of actually knowing what those mistakes are just by looking at the code. For the record, we have a trailing comma just there in JSON, so that's obviously going to fail. And we have an if statement here, and at the end of it, there's no trailing uh, double quotes there. So what you could actually have is somebody could be the different type of the if statement, and then they go, oh, I've noticed that, it. but then there's also another problem with config maps as well. They don't line up to your code base. We use Golang primarily, but it doesn't actually matter what language you're using, because you could map these from any language as well. If somebody changes the config, the config in the application, there's no way of getting your CI/CD pipeline to say, "Hey, Upshaw, you've broken this, or it's going to not, it's not going to work." In that, the only way you're going to know that is when you try and deploy it, and it doesn't work. So, what would be really nice is if we could actually import the the GoLang value, the GoLang struct, straight out of your application. So, let's look at the design goals we've got from an installer. It should be opinionated. Now, if you're if you're somebody in the pub and you meet somebody who's really opinionated, that's really boring. But when you're actually talking about software development, opinionated, I would argue, is good. Because we know, people of Gitpod know how to install Gitpod best. We know how to run Gitpod best because that's our job. If we can implement that in a programmatic, repeatable way, we can give you the benefit of our four or five years of running Gitpod, and we can actually put that in the, in, in the application. So they're going to make it a little easier to install, install that. We're going to put you on rails that say, you know, stick down this track and you'll be fine. If you go off there, you're going to have trouble, but stick down here, you'll be grand. We also want to make it simple. By default, we want to make a config that works that you can do with no or minimal changes. We also want it to be flexible. As I said at the start, we have to install it on Gitpod, which has got multiple clusters running all around the world that's coping with the hundreds, hundreds of thousands of users. We've also got Massive Bank PLC. They've got 5,000 users. We've also got a small design, design house who's got 10 users who don't really know Kubernetes too well, but they want to use it. And then we've also got that, self, that person who's a bit of a hacker who likes to play around with things. Those, that's a lot of different people we've got to cater for. We also want secure config. Now, there's somebody I was just talking to, there was just into a conference, a uh, uh, talk in there, and he said quite rightly that secure means a lot of things to different people. So, if you've worked with me for more than five minutes, I'm a big fan of the 12 factor app. That is their definition of it. A litmus test for whether an app has all the config correctly factored out of the code is whether the code base could be made open source at any moment without compromising any credentials. That is a brilliant definition of secure. So, it doesn't work for us because we are open source anyway. So this is my definition. A customer could submit their config YAML via Discord, email, or a GitHub ticket without compromising any credentials. I don't want to be send. I don't want people to be saying to me, "Hey Simon, can you help me with this cluster?" Uh, yeah, this is one bit of my stuff. It's like oh, I've had to factor out this password here that's in there. I just want them to be able to send it without even thinking about it. And I can look at it and go, "Yeah, I can see where your problem is. This is what you need to do to solve it." 
some design patterns. Everyone loves design patterns. I mentioned it earlier, Golang. Helm and Kubernetes are all written in Golang. If we can build on that and if we can use that, brilliant, that's great. Parity with components. So the components in the installer, I mentioned earlier about how we used to just throw it over the wall to the platform team. Well, we've got people from the workspace team in there here today. We've got also a web app team. We've got an IDE team. Make them own the components. The installer is not owned by the self-hosted team. There are going to be bits are, certainly. But if you are, I don't know, going to be deploying an application that's, in, that's owned by the, work, the workspace team, well, they're the ones who are going to know how best to install it because that's their job. I'm not going to know it because that's not my job. People in there, let's build upon their experience. Uh, code ownership, exactly, I, yeah, mentioned it again. It's, this is not Simon's baby. When we first introduced this, everyone sort of started, oh, it's Simon's installer. By changing the code ownership levels, it became everybody's installer. Actually, one of the best things I love about seeing this is I get, I get emails from GitHub saying, you know, so-and-so has, has uh, done a thing, on, uh, done a commit, a PR on the installer. And I'll see it because I see all the emails because I can't seem to turn them off. Um, but you know, somebody else is looking at it, they're somebody else is reviewing it, it's all working quite as a nice, well-oiled machine. One of the other problems, and so we also, we're gonna build, the end goal is to build some YAML. That's actually gonna be really important when we wanna support GitOps. Uh, image tags are injected into the build. We have, as I said, about 50 images. They've all got uh, SHA commits as their tag names. Let's embed those into the installer itself. That's gonna be part of the binary. But too well again because of the screen. But this is a minimal config. This is what you get if you go uh, git pod installer in it. The only change you have to do there is the domain. You have to put in your own domain. But if you just change your domain and you just run that, that will give you git the dependencies, your database, your object, object storage, and uh, your Docker registry, they're gonna be in cluster, they're not gonna be particularly performant, but it's gonna work. The person who's been told by their boss to go and investigate GitHub, they can actually go and get that up. They can get that running in 20 minutes, and most of that time is waiting for your cluster to provision. Let's have a look at our fictional customer, Massive Bank PLC. They've got, a, they've got their own, um, they've got an external registry, they've got an external database, they've got an external object storage. Well, look here. It really went, I'm really sorry this is a bit small, but it's, um, we've referenced here some secrets. Uh, so the object storage there, we're not using in cluster, um, and we're just referencing a secret there. That's how we do it. So they can send, Massive Bank PLC can send that to me over email. No, no credentials are gonna get compromised. They might wanna ch take out their, their domain name, that's fine, but it's not, I can see what they're doing there. We also have the composite render funk. This is basically how it all works internally. Um, so we build upon, you know, this should, if you know Helm, this should look fairly familiar. So we have a, a directory here which introduces everything. This is our dashboard, which is one of the more simple components. We're saying we've got a deploy, we've got a network policy, we've got a role binding, we've got a common service there. That's gonna all generate that. And then we're just using the default Golang here. Again, if you know Helm, that's exactly the same stuff. It's just generating it using the Golang struct. Helm dependency injection, I mentioned it earlier, that's really useful. Helm template to the rescue. I don't want to be defining and looking after my SQL. I don't want to be looking after RabbitMQ. So we've written here um, a Helm import template, which basically just wraps the, the Helm template function. Um, in, it does basically exactly the same as if you go Helm template whatever the template is, and it will generate the YAML for it. That injects it into, that, that basically, at the end here, you end up with a string. So you, with all the values that we've got there, that's YAML there. Validation, I mentioned this earlier, is one of the big problems that we have with Helm. With, a Git, with an installer, you can, you can pass it in, you can actually then validate what you've got. So we've got two types of validation. We've got your config, so you can say, yes, this config is valid, or no, it's not, and you can give an indication as to what's, what's wrong with it. Same also with your cluster. We can connect a con uh, to client go, we can take the kube config file, and we can say, uh, yeah, your cluster's fine, or oh, you're not running on Ubuntu, or you've got the wrong kernel version, or you don't have the right node labels. We can actually do that beforehand, so we know if the inst installation is gonna succeed or not. Some of the benefits that we've had. Lower barrier to entry is the big one that I love. And uh, code ownership. 
lots of benefits in there. One of the problems with Helm is, that, I'll go back to code ownership, is because it's all a flat file, you can't very easily inside GitHub, um, the, 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 the owner's file, you can't say who owns what code without splitting it out into different modules. Well, because we're doing it in separate uh, Golang modules, we can, that's nice and easy. It's not, all, it's not all plain sailing, there has been a few drawbacks. The biggest one is people are resistant to change. People like the Helm because they know it. Oh, I can contribute to Helm because I know it. That's always a problem as well. Uh, the complexity is abstracted away. It's, you know, with Helm, you can control everything. We're giving people guide rails to work on by getting rid of that. There are going to be some people who have problems with that and it won't necessarily work for their installation. We've introduced a thing at the moment which we've called um, post-processing, where you could effectively edit the YAML file at the end of it and we actually tell people how to do that. That's effectively how we solve that one. And we also have to create our own secrets. But again, we tell people what to do with that. It's fairly straightforward and it's part of the validation. The future. So we've recently introduced Replicated, which is a, paid, a service that we subscribe to. Um, this is a Kubernetes job that runs in the installer, effectively runs what you're doing. It's an, from, from, from your point of view as a user, it's a nice fancy GUI for your config. It builds all the secrets for you. It takes everything and it says, right, okay, we'll do everything you need for the cluster and then we'll, we'll install Gitpod. But it also adds for us quite a lot of additional benefits like we've got um, validation, there's pre-flight checks and there's ways of uh, us getting support bundles so we can actually see without actually having anybody to uh, send anything over the wire, they can just click a button and it sends us the support bundles. Um, another thing we want to do is remove unnecessary config. So I said to you earlier when I showed you the minimal config, that was still 30 lines long. We could conceivably get that down to two, the API version and the domain name, and everything else will be default. That's where we could go with that, where we we're going to go with that. And finally, QuickPod. Uh, we had an offsite in Portugal back in March, and uh, my team won one of the prizes for the hackathon we had. And this is, uh, this is going to be coming very, very shortly, actually. Uh, there's a PR open for this at the moment, as of yesterday, um, where we're going to be able to run it on a single instance of, say, K3D. So you can run it on your own laptop, and it just runs automatically as a local machine. Uh, one of the things I love about the internet is that the people, the internet is full of people who are positive, open, resistant to change. Um, <laughs> the very first comment we had was actually really negative. So I've done a lot of work on this. I basically spent August to the end of December working non-stop flat out, quite a lot of hours a day on the installer, put a lot of hard work into it. This was the first comment. Honestly, I think it's a bad decision. That was great. The decision to move away from Helm, there's simply too many possible configurations. That came within 10 minutes of the first publish of it. Two weeks later, that bloke bought 5,000 licenses. <laughs> so I'm not saying he hasn't got a point, and he absolutely did have a point with the configurations which I've addressed earlier, but uh, you know that's one of the problems that we had. We had a bit of better, more positive feedback later on. That was always nice to have it. Would I do it again? In these specific circumstances, yes, I would. It was a really good decision to make because we're an open source project where we use an open source for everything. If you're working on something where it's small, if you're working on something where you've only got maybe a few components, don't do this. This is hard work. But if you've got something which is a lot of stuff, you've got a lot of components, you've got a lot of people in open source and it's difficult to install, definitely look at investigating in your own installer. Best thing is that every, all of our stuff is open source. You can see the installer, you can take ideas from it, you can nick it wholesale if you want. That's me, I'm Simon Ems, I'm the Shroppy Beak on Twitter, I mostly talk about my beekeeping. And we also have there, for anybody here who uh, wants to try Gitpod SaaS, there's a code there for three months of Gitpod Unlimited. Go to gitpod.io and put in the code Valencia3. Thank you very much.